pain and suffering are two things that people usually don't want to talk about. Oh, we like the stories of people overcoming. We like the one or two great heroes we throw out there and say, oh, how wonderful that they made it. You know, like Johnny Erickson Tata or a recent man from Australia, I believe. I can't think of his name, but, um, you know, no arms and no legs. And, you know, he's able to overcome. And we lift them up as great examples to show other people how they too can make it. They can rise to the occasion. They can go through the suffering and pain that it took for them to get where they are today. But we don't talk about the everyday life they had to live to get to the place of suddenly now bursting on the scene in Christianity and being lifted up as a hero of the faith. We don't talk about the everyday suffering that they went through, the trials, the agonies, the times of despair, the times of hopelessness, helplessness, the times of failure, the times of death, the times of dying, do we? See, that's not a popular message. It's not a popular teaching to say, you will suffer. Oh, Jesus will be there, but you will suffer. You will go through tribulation. Oh, well, maybe not the great tribulation, but you will suffer the loss. You will feel the pain. You will agonize in the garden. You will hurt and be hurt. That's not a popular message. You know, it's always fun to say, oh, well, we'll overcome. But it's not easy to say, you might not. Oh, sure, hang in there. But to the person who's suffering, who's going through the detox or going through the, the after effects of being a drug addict or being delivered, yes, from the bondage, but not the consequence of sin in their life. That's not an easy message to give because, you see, unless you have suffered with them, unless you have been there beside them, unless you have held someone's hand who's hurting or dying or watched that last gasp of a person who dies in front of your eyes. You know, when the black death comes out of their mouth, they vomit all over themselves and it's disgusting and gross and it's not a pleasant sight. You don't want anyone else to see it because you know they can't handle it, so you clean them up real fast and then call the family in in order to watch their loved one depart because it's not a pretty sight. Death has never been something that people want to talk about. Dying is not something that people really want to experience. And yet it is a part of our life. Jesus prepared himself in the Garden of Gethsemane for the great suffering and for the great dying that he was going to go through. We in life should be more attuned to and aware of treating our people with care and consideration than marching them off to a hospital or hospice care. We should be taking the church into the homes where we put our old folks and we say, oh, you take care of it. We don't have an answer for you. We don't like to deal with that subject. And now that people are getting older and the majority of Christians, the greater vast majority of Christians are elderly. Do we want to treat our old folks as though they were not sages and elders of the faith? And we just want to move them aside and set them aside because, you know, it's too hard to deal with somebody like, you know, an older person, you know, like Caleb, who is ready to go back into the land of Israel again for the third time? Excuse me? Or the sages like Abraham, at what age did he finally be used by God? Or Chuck Smith, when did he start his real ministry? You see, there's something about wanting to use the youth that is always something that we like to focus in on, zero in on. We like our heroes to look young and fit and full of vigor and zest and zeal. We want them all to be Jesus at the age of 30. We don't want Jesus as a white-haired old man or elderly or flowing with, you know, white hair of age that we see in the book of Revelation. 
a matter of fact, age is treated not with respect in this country. And sadly, in Christianity, in evangelical Christianity, we don't see as much, really, as possibly other cultures do treat their older and elderly folk. What are you going to do when you get old? Or will you? What are you going to do if you are old? What are you going to do if you die? How will you handle suffering? Are you one of those people that avoid it like the plague? You just run away and hide? That when you're hurting, when you're in need, your church isn't there beside you? Because they're busy, aren't they? Isn't that the reality of what Christian life is today? Oh, we'll set you up a camera maybe, you know, and that would be a ministry that would be phenomenal. You know, the internet ministry could be something that we could take into the nursing homes if we would go. It's something we could take into where people are shut up and shut in if we would go. But who will go? And how shall they hear? Would we not be best left if we went to those places where people are left behind, into the hospitals? into the hospices, into the places where people are dying. Maybe they don't have eternity. Maybe they don't have much time left. Or maybe they have something to bless us with. My question to you is, are you ready to give Jesus an answer for the reason why you would not go to where he has been all along waiting for us to go? The servant of the Lord must be gentle. When God conquers us and takes all the flint out of our nature and we get deep visions of the Spirit of Jesus, we then see as never before the great rarity of gentleness of spirit in this dark and unheavenly world. The graces of the Spirit do not settle themselves down upon us by chance. And if we do not discern certain states of grace and choose them, and in our thoughts nourish them, they will never become fastened to our nature or our behavior. If we don't prepare ourselves for death, we'll never be prepared for life. If we don't realize we are dying, we'll never appreciate the fact of living. The person who knows they only have a few short hours left are so sensitized to everything around them, they can smell, see, touch, and feel in a way that others cannot and have no capacity for. One of the best things that I have said to most people that I know is that the fact of my dying made my living so much more a reality in my life. And I enjoyed it so much more and I appreciate the extra time that God has given me to live on this earth. Every advanced step in grace must be preceded first by apprehending it and then a prayerful resolve to have it. So few are willing to undergo the suffering out of which through gentleness comes. There would have been no genti gentility in me, no care confrontation, except that the great pain and agonizing sorrow and the great suffering that I went through for over 10 years of my life that I would not be sensitive to other people or care. It hurt. It hurt. It hurt. So few are willing to undergo the suffering out of which through gentleness comes. We must die before we are turned into gentle people. And crucifixion involves suffering. It is a real breaking and crushing of self which wings and rings the heart and conquers the mind. What happens when you lose your loved one and your family? You'll be gentler and more tender towards everyone else around you. You will. When your mother dies, your father dies, or your sister or brother, or someone close to you, or your very own child, you'll learn very quickly why this is the love that we share to each other, and that this is what would make manifest to the world the love that we have for the brethren. There is a good deal of mere mental and logical sanctification nowadays, which is only a religious fiction. It doesn't stand in the source of suffering. It consists of mentally putting oneself on the altar and then mentally saying the altar sanctifies the gift and then logically concluding there is, therefore one is sanctified and such a one goes forth with a gay, flippant, theological prattle about the deep things of God and they have no concept of the sufferings of Jesus. But the natural 
Heart strings have not been snapped, and the Adamic flint has not been ground to powder, and the bosom has not throbbed with the lonely surging sighs of Gethsemane. And not having the real death marks of Calvary, there cannot be that soft, sweet, gentle, floating, victorious, overflowing, triumphant life that flows like a spring every morning from an empty tomb. And great grace was upon them all. People say that I have such great capability of laughter, that I have a joy that is unspeakable, that bubbles out out of nowhere and suddenly bursts forth like a great wellspring of, of, of just awesome frivolity that is set free from the boundaries of this fleshly body that I live in. And there's only one way that the deep wellsprings that laughter rolls from out of my, my stomach all the way up to my throat and out my mouth. And that echoes in the chambers of the churches that I visit or the churches I'm a part of. And that laughter comes from the tears, from the very drilling down into my soul that God caused a hole to be placed there. That it would come up out of, oh yeah, there's no doubt, there's joy there. And when I laugh, you can know the joy. Because people are affected by it and infected with it. It's all been my life, throughout my life, that people have commented on that. But it comes from the great drilling down and drilling into my soul that God has caused me to hurt, to whimper, to cry, to be still before my God and to have Him only alone as my solace and my comfort. Because in the desperate times, in the lonely times when we should have the body of believers come together to comfort one when the elders should be laying hands and the people should be standing around singing the songs to the person in the hospital bed in the nursing home in the place where they alone are sitting wishing that they could be a part of the church where the church will not go outside of itself but sits inside so that it can be made whole that person cries out alone. They know why I'm able to laugh. They know why I have such deep calling to deep things of the Spirit. Why there is such a big hole that is filled with the Holy Spirit that makes me whole and complete in Him. There's only one way, and it's a way that I chose a long time ago, to get where I am today. Some call it in the classic writings of imitation of Christ and other places where the church fathers have talked about this and the church tradition sometimes has confused it but for the most part it explains it pretty clear. The only way to get tenderized is through suffering. If you're unwilling to suffer with Jesus you'll never be as close to Jesus as you want to be. You'll never experience all the joys that there are in knowing God in a way that you may not necessarily want to go. Nobody in their right mind chose to suffer except Jesus. Jesus endured the cross, you know, endured the shame, recognizing the cross was the only way to get through to humanity that was so hardened of heart that it had turned its back on the loving Father and had only a realization of the judgment of God and they were just waiting for destruction to come. Our world today is hardened of heart. He has begotten so calloused and so far from what God wants it to be that we exonerate and we make up our heroes as though they were violent men and that violence was the answer for us to go that we should choose violence in order to declare the name of the Lord to those that are perishing and really don't know what it's like to be shot or killed or suffering or to suffer from killing someone with post-traumatic stress disorder <clears throat> or to have that blood of another man cry out from the earth what did you do to me? Why am I condemned for eternity? And you took my life. You see, there's a lot of things that are deep, that calls to deep. And unless you pursue them through the veil, 
unless you go to God in the way that he wants you to travail, unless you really want to experience the sufferings of Christ, you'll never know the life of Jesus and why he is that tenderness and why he really is that gentleness and why violence really isn't the answer. Because the violent take the kingdom by force. And up until now, we suffer violence. And they think that they win. But the truth is, no. It is by the tenderness and the gentleness, by the meekness, by the humbleness, by the holiness of what God wants us to be when we are humbled in humility by the sufferings that we go through in this life. Don't avoid the subject of death. Don't run away from dying. Don't deny when Jesus says, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Or Paul saying, I die that I may gain. Learn that. Because there are people out there in nursing homes, in hospitals, in long-term care units, in places where maybe you know, family might visit and might not, and might have shuffled people off. That we as a church could go to, that we as a people should be there, that we as a people should never have allowed them to come into existence because we as a family of God should be the ones that are taking care of those saints of God that maybe have been set aside in order to die alone in a place where God never sent them. And God doesn't want them to be all alone. So he walks in the midst of them. Let's not forsake the elderly, or the old, or the feeble. Let's not neglect those who are of weakened knees that are ready to faint. Let's not give up on the one who has the last heartbeat that's sitting there hoping that, watching, I've seen what it would be like if I could get out of this bed and go to where the church is. How much more so would Jesus say, get out of the church and go to where Jesus is? Because in that one person, that one hand that you might hold, that one person is dying and knocking on death's door to go into eternity. Would it not be a great time of rejoicing to have a worship service, to welcome them into heaven, as opposed to having them with the terrors of hell tearing at their feeble faith and weakening them from realizing that yes, Jesus is taking them the rest of the way home. God, don't let them die in vain. And don't let them die alone. Go to those where you would think not to go. And if you have to, start a church there. In the nursing homes, in the hospitals, in places where elderly should be lifted up in America where we should be treating our olders and our elders with respect and grace instead of shuffling them off as second place. Let's have a missionary outreach, but don't take the old folk. Take the young ones. I'm sorry, but the Gentile world disgusts me in some ways because the old should be with the young. There should be old folks, there should be elderly people teaching young children. It should be grandmothers in Sunday school, not young men wanting to move into the ministry, going into Sunday school and teaching. It should be a mixture of ages in everything that we do in Jesus' name. It shouldn't be regulated, it shouldn't be relegated, it shouldn't be separated. You shouldn't have high school versus junior high. or old folk versus young folk. I'm sorry. It's not the way it's done in Jewish culture. It shouldn't be done in Gentile culture. And it shouldn't be done in the kingdom of God. We should be family. And we should all be living together. And though that's idealistic, I admit it's realistic also because it is what Jesus said to do. The kingdom of heaven has come upon you. Have you recognized it today? Go and do what Jesus said.